Well, welcome back. You know, we've talked a lot about data, and we talked a lot about analytics. And people will ask me all the time, you know, Laura, what groups do analytics well? And I always say, you know, one of my favorite case studies is Intel. And I always go back to my friend Manny I, and say to Manny, you know, how do you build a group for analytics that's really centered on business use cases and driving new thoughts for analytics? And Manny's been at Intel for 17 years and he coordinates a group that's very focused on projects for factory operations, capacity planning, process control, but really testing new forms of analytics. He's had experience at Honeywell, at Motorola, and he's well known in almost every analytics group that I know of and teaches at MIT. And I did a podcast recently with Manny and one of my biggest takeaways is, you know, we focus on technology, we think a lot about people, but the hardest thing is getting people to ask the right questions. And he's going to talk about how do you help people to ask the right questions. Manny, welcome to the stage. Thanks, Laura. How do we build the data-driven organization? Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, when I said uh, to Laura that asking the right questions, it's not for you to ask me the right questions today. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, excellent presentation. In fact, uh, I'm going to be picking back on uh, the previous presentation in terms of where and uh, what analytics, supply chain analytics is playing. But uh, before that, I want to kind of give a brief glimpse of Intel. I think most of you know Intel Corporation, uh, but Intel is going through a big transformation right now. And uh, we were known as the PC industry for many, many years, but as you can see, the transformation is happening around the customer experience, the data center being the rock of what we do, and uh, client supporting as well as some of the wearables. We are into drones now. I don't know how many of you had a chance to stop over at uh, Intel uh, tables uh, where we had uh, you know, wearables that actually is being used not just in sports, like the, the skiers are wearing that and then they're going down, and you can actually experience what they're going through. And that's also being used today in the industry for remote monitoring, remote diagnostics, connecting that with the internet of things and other great things that are coming our way. I'm excited about the future and uh, where we are heading. And uh, our CEO, Brian Krasanich, calls Intel's uh, as a virtuous cycle of growth. What is actually propelling growth for the industry and for Intel? Primarily, it's a combination of several things. I'm listing from an Intel perspective, the cloud and data center is driving a whole lot of things. The things and devices, the analytics uh, uh, that is driving it is also critical. And the other components like the memory and the, you know, like the Altera acquisition, they're all kind of supporting our $55 billion uh, you know, revenue plus, and also 100,000 people. And uh, going to the next page, I want to give you a glimpse of what are the strengths Intel brings to the table and how supply chain kind of fits in there. I call them as the four themes or the four pillars. The first one is definitely a big one for us, which is the technology leadership. I'm sure you have, most of you have heard Moore's Law at least once, right? This is Gordon Moore, our uh, ex-CEO who actually uh, was jotting down in a discussion on a napkin how the transistor, the technology of computing is going to be evolving. His comment at that time was he just drew a curve showing every 18 months, give or take, the number of transistors on a chip is going to double. And uh, while the cost comes down by half, and the density or the size is going to be half as well. So that was 30 years ago, and now we're still tracking the Moore's Law. There are a lot of questions around Moore's Law is dead. I think there's a lot of challenge. In fact, some of the tools and techniques that we're using, the nanotechnology, is pushing the bound, you know, boundaries of physics, and uh, a lot of challenges there, but we're still plowing along, and that is bringing excellent products and experience to all of us. The other one is the manufacturing scale. 
uh, to build a factory, what we call as the fabrication facility, it's gonna be in the range of around $4 billion. Very expensive. And uh, the equipments are really, really expensive. In fact, some of the tools, the litho tools we use, can range from $30 million, depending on the type you're looking at, to $130 million, the extreme ultraviolet, you know, like latest tools. So imagine a supply chain where, and also the technology takes longer. It's not immediately that we're gonna be able to go buy this tool. We have to work with our suppliers as partners. We have to understand technology. We have to understand competition. We have to understand process limitations. We have to understand what is even available. Is this metal, is this chemistry available? We heard great presentation from BASF, right? So what is available for us? What is that we can use to push the extremes of science is some of the things we are looking at. And then of course, supply chain, has taken as, you know, like it's not a cost component or you know, cost counter anymore. We are at the seat of the table with the business units, talking about, hey, this is the kind of metal we're looking at. Is it even available? This particular chemical, are we going to be able to do it at bulk delivery? Are we going to do it on premise? Or for that matter, including, how do we make sure that our distribution centers are enabling quick turnarounds? So those are all the discussions we have with the business units today. And we are doing all these things while being socially responsible. In fact, our transistor is, our microprocessor is basically conflict free. And uh, the conflict free comes not only just from uh, the social, uh, you know, like a CSR perspective, it is also coming from the reuse, recycle, rebound. Those are all the, you know, what is that we are giving back to the society? And how are we making sure that we are not leaving a heavy footprint? Those are all some of the things we really caring for the planet. So those are the four themes that is driving Intel's vision, which is if it is smart, I'm going to go back there, right? I think I probably skipped right through it. If it is smart and connected, it is best with Intel. So that's pretty much the driver for us right now. So if you come and ask me, hey, Intel supply chain, you say it is big and complex. It is not big from the number of SKUs perspective. But the, the process that we have to go through, the way we have to deal with the customer, the components, is what makes our supply chain big and complex in terms of technology. I have put some numbers out there. I mentioned four million square feet manufacturing space, 10 factories around the world. We have what we call as the front end fabrication facility where the wafer, you know, like a size of a dinner plate, we transform it from sand to silicon, to transistor, to a device. And then we also have the assembly facility that basically takes this wafer. We, can, we may have thousands, hundred thousands, you know, like what we call as the chips, uh, the CPUs uh, on a wafer, convert that into a die, package it, and then it goes into many of the devices. And then we have to make it in different sizes, different configurations, different capabilities, uh, for, you know, like all the way from servers to uh, basic simple products that may be going into IoT, for example, in a sensor. And uh, our spends are in the range of around $22 billion. The CapEx is around uh, 7 to $8, 9000000000 billion, depending on, you know, like where we are. And everything else is pretty much uh, indirect and all this supply chain related uh, spends. So, Accordingly, that uh, increases the number of uh, transactions, uh, it increases our uh, transportation, so all those things are kind of baked into our system. And we heard great presentations where people talked about metrics and what drives your supply chain, what are the things you really care for. We start with the customer, just like we, what we heard from Snyder Electric, right? Customer requirements customer satisfaction, and we align our uh, metrics with the APEX score metrics. Perfect order, order fulfillment, late time, and then for us, given that our asset uh, is really, really a big component of supply chain, asset utilization becomes a big deal. So that immediately puts a question on how do we treat our supply chain? What are the different segments we need to have? I'm gonna get into that. Some of them is asset, uh, you know, like, is it responsive, is it reliable, is it, you know, like, so we're gonna, we, we'll get into that as well. And uh, so primarily cost is definitely a big deal. Quality is always given, 
whether it is, you know, it's an end-to-end -end quality is what we're looking at. Availability in terms of speed it matters, particularly it matters for new products, time to market. Do we have the availability, agility, and uh, fungibility to convert our supply, the big supply chain engine, to make things in millions and also make things in hundreds to get to the new product? How do we make that happen? And then technology, I talked about it. And then, of course, sustainability. So I primarily manage the supply chain analytics uh, and uh, what we call as the supply chain intelligence and analytics. Intelligence is more from a strategy of setting perspective and then understanding uh, the business unit needs, aligning with our existing capability, looking what our GMs call as bring me the outside in perspective. I guess I got a lot of it in, in this conference, so I'm happy to go back with several nuggets this time. And uh, so when we put this all together, I don't want to just simply call analytics as a standalone, because when we start looking at what are the requirements, what are the metrics that we are driving, what's the vision, and how do we get from a vision to business strategy, to supply chain strategy, to hit the metrics, we have to have the tools and capabilities. Analytics can be a simple, uh, you know, like a dashboard to a very advanced, uh, you know, like a, well, multi, uh, you know, like an integral calculus or, you know, multiple uh, objective functions or, you know, data mining kind of things. It could be anything. So my team is focusing on, again, going back to Laura's comment, when someone is coming and saying, I need an inventory solution for this. Okay, I get it. What inventory solution are you looking for? Are you looking for forecasting? Are you looking for better planning? Are you looking for a better network strategy for inventory? Are you trying to plan? Are you trying to monitor? Or are you trying to control? What is that you're trying to do? And then what dials do you want to move? Are you looking at inventory for better customer satisfaction, you know, service levels? Are you looking as it as a buffering strategy, or are you trying to bring the inventory down so that you can have a cost advantage? What is that? Because this is all multi-objective functions. So that's where the engagement, the question starts. And then we don't stop right there, because if there is one, supply chain is a network of networks. So if I just blindly go with one of my business units or one of my stakeholder who is asking me to develop an optimization solution, I may be doing a great job of optimizing their problem. Maybe they may be able to show an excellent service level, may, able, may be able to bring the inventory down in the assembly, but that may create ripple effects somewhere else. So we need to really look end to end, and then we need to ask question, how is it gonna impact our network strategy? What is our distribution if we were to, you know, like reduce the inventory you know, right here? So those are all the things that questions that we frame, we work with them, and then we want to make sure that we are partners, not providers of these questions. And we create the solutions. So this particular slide is, the question always comes up is, what is your scope? Where exactly can you apply analytics? To me, the answer is everywhere where it makes sense. So if you look at it, that's where you know, the picture looks kind of bigger, but I also have it colored as demand and supply, but the questions, are different, but the connectivity is critical across the board. And I'm going to be taking uh, advantage of this time to share some of the solutions we have put together for analytics that will go very nicely with the previous presenter in terms of showing what capabilities we need. But these capabilities will not exist even if you have all the data that you need, even if you have all the tools that you have, and even if you have the people who are willing to work with you, if you don't have the right talent and the right credibility that you establish over a period of time, everything is gonna be a waste. So I'm gonna spend a little bit more time on it, but uh, just wanna kind of sh share with you what my team looks like. It's a small team of around 15 people, and it's a combination of software development, whether it is the user interface or it is a database or it is a big data Hadoop kind of a thing or it is, you know, like a R, you know, we need to make sure we have that capability. 
and then knowledge of the enterprise system, whether it is SAP or Ariba. So that is also critical. And then the 15 people are by ourselves won't be able to do this. So we partner with IT, we partner with business units. So we put it, you know, like what we call as a center of excellence, and then we put project teams together to go solve this problem. And then on the right hand side, what I have is what I call as my data scientist diamond. And uh, in fact, I'm working on a knowledge engineer or knowledge, uh, you know, like a worker diamond as well. But if you look at it, if you want to be successful, this is, this is what uh, uh, the training we provide for our people uh, if they want to be data scientists. You better understand the domain, the body of knowledge. Uh, this goes back to Deming, right? I mean, you don't go improve if you don't understand the system. Understanding the system is number one. And then understanding variability in the system becomes easier. Once you understand the variability in the system, then you, you have a way to go work on it. That's where the knowledge factor comes in. And then you have to make sure that you're working with the right people. Are they uh, leading edge, uh, you know, like are, are they laggers in terms of agreeing with the solutions, right? So in this data scientist diamond, the domain knowledge is critical. And then I mentioned some software skills, and the analytic skills are critical. This is where there is a lot of evolution that is happening. In the past, if you have looked for analytics, you may see a statistician with knowledge in you know, regression, uh, nonlinear regression, or you know, like primarily traditional testing, or it could be you know, Bayesian network, and not, those kind of statisticians, right? And then you had another set of uh, analytic skill, what we call as the operation research engineers, who come from, uh, you know, like a, from a little bit of a deterministic, not stochastic, but they are experts in addressing what is the objective function I need to solve. I need to minimize cost. I need to reduce the cycle time. And what are the constraints that I need to go work with? And uh, so they put them all together in a way that you have a model that you can implement it. The planning solutions, most of the planning solutions hover around the uh, objective function of I need to be able to keep lower inventory, I need to be able to you know, get my products moving faster, and I need to be able to leverage my capacity better. So when you have this multi-objective function, you solve for it. And then of course there are local uh, constraints such as this particular product can only run in this particular factory. These are the, so you have to take all those into consideration. And in fact, when we look at our uh, planning solver, we have like 100,000 constraints and then we have to solve them periodically. So we have like uh, long range planning, which may or may not need all the rigor of the day to day kind of activities. And then we have the mid range and then of course the build plan, which is day to day to weekly. So our algorithms are different, but it works to enable the objective. And then the other big one is soft skills. You may be the expert analyst, but if you're not able to explain what you have done, why your algorithm and your solution that you're recommending is gonna address my business need, good luck. Many times it leads to frustration. The technical people would say, you know what, I'm talking to this person, he or she doesn't get it. Okay, that means we are not doing our job. What is that the person wants to solve? What exactly is the level that person can appreciate and understand? And are we speaking their language? Are we communicating? So to me, the soft skill, it's not just uh, you know, like presenting slides, it's, it's communicating, it's listening. It is basically having a good project management skill. So those are all the things that I put together. And then Laura mentioned to some of the other traditional things, yeah, you know, like the Lean Six Sigma, they still have a place because Again, if you're going, it's almost like how the software evolved, right? From uh, primarily going from a waterfall to spiral to expert programming, just like that, the whole process is evolving in terms of improvements. Are you on an incremental improvements or are you looking at a destructive kind of improvement? So you have to use the tools uh, for the right purpose. So now I'm gonna basically share with you quickly uh, some of the solutions we have put in place. And uh, the first one is about supply chain planning. All of you are experts in the space, right? 
I have a product that I have to make, and then I have a demand that is coming from my, you know, sales and marketing, and then I have to take into consideration the timing, the, the market, the competition, and so that is all the demand in, you know, information is feeding in, and then from a capacity perspective, particularly for us, asset rich, we have to really understand what's the forecast? What's my work in process? And then how do I, you know, what's my inventory positioning strategy? What's my buffering? And then what's my tolerance limit? What's my service level? So those priorities and everything come in, and then of course uh, our big solver kind of turns through that, and then it comes up with a material release plan. Most of the time, we get a match, but in reality, we don't. So that's when we have to go to this, you know, like uh, not matched kind of a thing. This is where it, it could be a discussion, you know, what we call, a, you know, in Intel, we have a weekly discussion around, okay, you know, are the priorities changed? Do we, how do we match supply and demand? Do I have to do something differently? So those are all the kind of things we do. For us, it is a, in fact, we went through a journey uh, with uh, our, you know, like a master production schedule, and then uh, what our process, we start out at the wafer, and then primarily is one unit, and then we convert that into, you know, like dice, and then the dice go out. So what we call as the fan-in, fan-out process. And the planning for that is, you know, like we have to look at wafer starts, we have to look at finished goods. So across the entire network, we are planning for it and then how many sites it's going into. So those are all the challenges we address. And then, of course, some people are attached to their Excel. We have enterprise system, we have legacy system. So if I were to come and tell you that, hey, I'm able to eliminate all the Excel spreadsheets, you can tell me I'm lying. So my question is how and where Excel plays a role how is it integrated with our databases, with our enterprise systems? What is our, do we have one version of truth? So those are the kind of things we focus on, and then that's how we are integrating, and uh, we have our planning, uh, you know, like a system that has got all these connections and connectivities across the board. And uh, some of the things we did while we went through this exercise, I'm clicking over there, is primarily you know, like reducing uh, the planning cycle time. That was a big deal for us. How can we quickly get our product out? So there, there is a certain theoretical cycle time for making the product, so I, I understand that. But there are a lot of other things, the planning and uh, you know, like the demand process, and uh, how can we reduce that? So those are some of the things we took our journey in terms of automating and uh, why when I, I I forgot to mention earlier that my approach to doing these kind of things is simplify, standardize, automate, argument. I'm not there with the autonomous part yet, but that's probably where I would like to go. And then in terms of uh, analytics, uh, you might have all seen this. You could use it as descriptive, diagnostics, predictive, prescriptive, and cognitive. So those are some of the approaches we're taking, where we want it, and then where, this is more like a prescriptive analytics, right? Because I'm telling you, telling the factory, what to make, when to make, where to make. I'm not doing the prediction. But in several cases, we do prediction. That's where the demand, you know, optimization kind of things happen, right? So another question uh, that always comes up is, hey, go solve me this problem. You know, I would like to understand uh, better, you know, what's the network strategy for us? What's the landed cost? And uh, so we go work on it. And if you don't ask the follow-on question as to, okay, if you have this particular answer with the range and everything, do you have any follow-on questions to it? So if you don't ask a question, the moment we go say, this is the inventory solution, this is the network solution, they say, what if we change something else? What if, if I'm able to uh, you know, like go from you know, versus land versus ocean? What are the possibilities I have? What if I'm able to deliver to my customers in uh, Latin America through Miami Hub versus putting a new uh, you know, like a distribution center in Brazil, for example, or what if I outsource my product versus making it internally? So we have to develop various what-if capabilities. The problem with what-if capabilities is sometimes we have the data, most of the time we don't. So we have to work with what's in front of us, and also it is not possible in some cases to wrap this kind of scenarios, what-ifs, in a mathematical formulation. That's where simulation plays a great role. And we have developed most of the uh, scenario planning is through decision analytics, through discrete event simulation, 
In some cases, it may be a simple Monte Carlo. And in other cases, we have a simulation that's running, and in other, you know, like inside the simulation, we have to optimize. Like for example, I'm going to show you how my network looks like if I'm running a new product, a hybrid. Uh, we recently started working on a few new products, and the question was, you know what, I don't want just inventory. I need to be able to sit with some of my suppliers. I need to understand you know, what strategy I have to you know, negotiate with them. If, if I'm asking for a service level of 95% or 97%, what should be, you know, like, what's the cost look like? So can you give me the trade-off? So from a procurement all the way to network, we do this kind of scenarios. And a simple view of our supply chain, uh, you know, like a simulator would look like this. This is what we have built internally, and we use several external tools which embed into it. There is a data layer, there is a business uh, you know, user interface that we build so that we don't want to be running the tool for our stakeholders. We want to build it for them with staggers and with almost like a dashboard where they can actually move the dial. And when they move the dial, the simulation happens, the results come out. And that way, we are moving on. Being a small team, we're moving on to the next work. In this particular case, what we're showing is we have the data set, a huge data set, by the way, which is uh, connected with the enterprise as well as our uh, you know, like, uh, data systems. And uh, then we have the network generator that is keeping our network in terms of understanding the supply network and then updating it as to what the routing is and what the data files are, demand, and all those details, right? And then we have to break that into fab assembly warehouse so that we, we have models that can only run the fab. If I'm looking at, hey, I need to understand my turns, I need to be able to switch them. So we have, it's almost like a Lego pieces that we can run them separately, or we can put them together to run them. And then we have a, a knowledge interchange broker. This is something we're still working on. This is where, we, you know, like, most of the time, and a question comes up, uh, having worked in Intel for 16 plus years, we have already answered that question in one form or the other. But if you don't have that you know, connectivity, if you don't have the data, or if you don't have the results, we may end up running it again. So this is where we're creating a knowledge broker, call it as a cognitive computing platform, if you will, to really, you know, like this is what we have asked. And, and another thing that we do is we always keep track of the decision path we took, not the other decision paths we could have taken, but we did not, right? So what if you have taken that decision path, how it would have yielded? in terms of cycle time or inventory. And then if you have that information, it's almost like a, you know, like IBM Watson or Entera kind of a solutions, right? It basically has the cognitive thinking and that's what we're trying to build. A question comes up, I don't wanna run through all these things. We've done this in the past. This is what it's gonna look like. Is this solution you know, like, uh, okay for you to go run the business? So what we're trying to do is we are cutting the time for decision from days, weeks, to maybe minutes. We're trying to get there, and that's where we want to embed this into the system as well. And uh, also, there's a lot of discussion around big data. You know, what are we doing around this? In fact, there was a couple of years ago, uh, our CIO and our uh, GM of supply chain got together, they said, Manny, we are hearing a whole lot of hype, this is three, four years ago, about big data. Come back and tell us what is the value? Because we don't want to chase the technology for the purpose of technology. Let us understand what the business values are. Where is it applicable? What is that we should be doing? We did a whole lot of analysis. Of course, uh, the big data goes with three Vs, right? Velocity, volume, variety. But it has to bring value. So we looked at it from that perspective, and one thing that struck us really is we put some use cases together, and then we, we have a strategic uh, roadmap, capability roadmap. We have it like a 2030, uh, 2025, 2030 kind of a roadmap that has got short-term capability needs, long-term capability needs. And then we kind of looked at, okay, th this, these are the metrics we need to move. This is where we want to be. This is how we want to serve our customers. These are the capabilities that we have today. These are the capabilities we need to develop. And these are the kind of tools and techniques that we can leverage to get there. And big data is one of the things using Hadoop and everything. So we primarily came up with some use cases. And this was a big one in terms of understanding the supplier intelligence. I would like to, uh, this is coming from our procurement, saying, you know what, we have several suppliers, 
particularly in the assembly side, uh, we have a lot of suppliers. We need to be able to understand what their, you know, like, and it's not just the financial, it's technical, it is the capability, you know, like it's quality, everything that is put together, what does it look like? Because our technology is changing, where do we, you know, place the bet? Are we going to go with supplier A, are we going to go with supplier B? What if the competition goes on a different technology path? How is it going to change? So we collected a whole lot of information, Wikipedia and uh, web crawling, and put them together into, OK, these are all the different types of things that are happening. Like, for example, wire bond versus flip chip. Where would it go? And what are the different suppliers today? And uh, so we did some analysis around and created capabilities for them where they can actually go select a particular product and the roadmap, and then they can go into, you know, break it into bill of materials, and then break, con connect that into a supplier intelligence uh, big data platform, and then they can do the analysis saying, okay, you know what, from a financial perspective, they're good, projections are looking good, technology, they're investing, they're innovating, and uh, the market is also going in this direction, so I'm okay to go invest. So the, this is helping us to shape our supply. So some of the predictive analytics is applied here. And uh, another question that always comes up, I'm sure all of you are familiar with this, is I would like to know how my supply chain looks from end to end. So there are a lot of good solutions out there. Uh, we heard about uh, Kinaxis, E2Open, and they provide a visibility, you know, more like a control tower. For us, we are also not only looking at visibility, we're also looking at prediction capability. So where would my next flashpoint going to happen? So some of the things you have done here is, how am I monitoring my inventory? How am I pre predicting where my challenges are? Is it within uh, the statistical control limits today? Is it going to change? Those are some of the things we developed. We call it as a dynamic inventory surveillance. And we could use this to reroute within our factory. We could connect this into our planning system for better health of our entire network. And, uh, we, we also have developed it in uh, Lego blocks more to speak so that we can actually do piecemeal if you want or connect it across the entire network. In fact, this is, and then we, uh, the other question that comes up is, okay, this visualization is great, but how do I ingest, I mean, how do I consume this information in an easier fashion? Because we're talking about thousands of SKUs. I want to be able to look at all SKUs, for example, or I want to be able to look at all the parameters. So we came up with a, you know, like a multivariate uh, heat map contrast kind of an approach where we can actually look at everything. What you are seeing right there is at one particular time, all the lots, all the SKUs in our supply network. So then we are basically looking at, based on our algorithms, uh, you know, like machine learning kind of algorithms, it's really kind of clustering uh, the things that are moving slowly. I mean, you can actually define what is the metric I'm looking at. Am I looking at the time to market, or you know, like what we call as the order fulfillment lead time. I mean, looking at perfect order, meaning there's a quality issue or something like that. So you can actually select those, and then that gives you, in you know, like at a very aggregate level, this is what is happening. And then you have the drill down capability to go down and actually see what the challenge is. If you don't mind, if you click on that, I just want to show a particular network how we are monitoring it. On the screen below, you see that. This is, you know, we have a control line, and then we, we are monitoring several. The green indicates, you know, like the things are moving well. But we are also, at every step of the way, we are taking that information and we are projecting forward based on what I know, how is it going to look like? The next, you know, we can set the time window, and we can also set the different products that we want to look at. Whether I'm looking at everything, whether I'm looking at a particular segment, we can do that. And if there is an issue, if there is a snag in our capacity, or if there is a snag in the supply somewhere, it will start showing up. And then once, I think it probably will take another second right there, so one particular product is out of control. So then we will be able to drill it down and we can go look at which one that is, and then this, is, this has not happened yet. It's going to happen maybe in a week's time or two weeks' time, depending on how we set the window. So obviously, there will be some forecast error. But directionally, it's now telling you that, hey, I got to go take a look at this. I need to understand. I need to get on top of this one. So this helps us to proactively look at it. 
So when we start talking about supply chain, autonomous supply chain, or this is more like an augmented supply chain, it's a sense and respond. So that's exactly what we're trying to do here. And so this basically is showing out of control, in control. And so when you look at this, some of the examples I'm sharing, I'm not specifically, when I walked in here, Laura was saying I'm gonna talk about talent. I did talk about it a little bit, but I'm talking more about the capabilities that we need in the change uh, as the, you know, like the technology is changing, what are the analytics that are needed? But if you start putting this together, who is going to be working on this, right? What kind of talent? If you go to the university, how and where would I hire this kind of skills? Is this a unicorn or is it something that we hire somebody, train them, or do we work with the universities? So we do, all the above. We, we are part of uh, some of the uh, consortia, we are part of the university board, and then we are sitting on some of the curriculum saying, you know, where exactly is it going? What are the challenges we're gonna have today, you know, 10 years from now, and where we would like to invest? So some of the things we're doing, and then since we're talking about several technology, I wanted to put in a couple of slides. So this is kind of where we are going to be imagining part right, is coming up, right? So Internet of Things is being called as the Industry 4.0, the next revolution. And the question that comes up is we, we have an IoT group. We are working with them on smart manufacturing as well as smart supply chain. We have several solutions. We are partnering with several folks in this one. The question that came up was, realistically, where all can we use Internet of Things in what fashion? Is it in the sourcing space? Is it in the manufacturing space? Is it in the deliver? Is it in the return or is it in all? So we put some of the things together saying, you know what? Number one, better visibility, better forecast, better response. So let us kind of breaking it down into how do I run my supply chain better? How do I know what's gonna happen? And then how do I you know, like, you know, like monitor my metrics? Those are areas where we can start. And then the next question is, we don't know what we don't know. I mean, uh, this is where uh, the things that we do traditionally may or may not pan out. Like for example, the drones flying all over the place. What does the network, the ecosystem of drones look like when they're delivering product? What would Uber be doing? They're now not, not just transporting people, they are logistics provider. We heard that from Jeremiah, right? How and where and when we should be ready to embrace this? And in this particular case, we looked at IoT, it could be a sensor, it could be a gateway, it could be an algorithm analytics that's sitting somewhere in the system, like for example, the Amazon Dash is a great example, right? I mean, you just press a button, voila, you get your product. And there are other solutions, the Samsung refrigerator, so it basically communicates, and some of the smart homes. From a supply chain perspective, we need to be thinking about how do we connect them all together? What kind of edge analytics is required and then security is a big deal for us. If someone else is uh, ordering food from my Samsung and then it's going to their address, it's gonna be a trouble, right? So I mean, we have to watch those kind of things. And this is a depiction of how an IoT-enabled supply chain might look like. So you can see that there are a lot of activities going on, the traditional supplier, the factories, the warehouses, the information is flowing back and forth, the API is connecting and then primarily the data is at the edge. It does not make sense to convert all the data into information and knowledge at the edge, but some of it we have to. That means what kind of te technology is needed, compute technology, what kind of analytics technology, what kind of connectivity with the 5Gs you know, coming, right? That means basically the sensors can talk to each other. They don't have to be broadcasting back and forth. How do we leverage those things? And then where does the end-to-end -end visibility sit? So those are all some of the things we're kind of envisioning, but videos are always better. So I have a very short video.
So I want to bring, it, bring us all back to the topic of the discussion from my perspective. How do we make this all happen? Is it technology? Is it the opportunity? Or is it the people, the right people? How critical is talent? The way we manage our talent is start you know, with the right, get the right people on board, right? Attract. Make sure that they want to come and work for you. And hire the right people. And then we want to make sure that they feel part of us, integrating them, not just our process technology tools, but our culture, strong culture, right? And then we are we're not done just hiring, but we need to develop them. We need to have a career roadmap. We have a career discussion with them. We want to know, OK, I, I'm just coming as an operation research engineer. What is that I want to do? OK, do you, have you heard of data scientist? So, OK, I did. OK, let's talk about it. So having that dialogue and having a career path for them, and then monitoring and tracking pro progress to help them out. So some of the things that we do to keep our talent nurtured and addressing the big challenge that is in front of us, which is talent in this new economy. Thank you. So we're not going to let you get off so fast here. So you support within Intel lots of managers or leaders, right? Yes. If you had to think about the characteristic of the leader that makes them the most able to use analytics or build talent, what would it be? I think they have to be innovative thinking because if sometimes the managers and leaders, they are managers and leaders because they have been successful in what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So there is a tendency of let me keep doing what I'm doing because I'm really good at it. So challenging the status quo and making sure that they can think outside the box is something that I always ask them to. What if? Always imagine, again, going back to this, right? Imagine if we can do this. In fact, we started our 3D printing activity you know, program three years ago with an imagine question. The question was, we were having challenges with some products, some fulfillment, which we don't use them all the time, but when we need them, we need them at that time. So our solution was we would just keep them in inventory. And either it would, you know, shelf life is not a big problem, but it could be a problem, or it could be obsolete. So we wanted to say, okay, what about 3D printing this? Oh, that's not going to happen because it's a metal, blah, 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 its size is big. They said, okay, imagine you have a 3D printer in your factory and you need this product tomorrow. You know that you have all the digital files, again, getting into the digital supply chain. And you know that by pushing the button, you, we have to make sure the metal and everything is there. By pushing the button, you're going to have that product in about three hours versus having the whole inventory, supply chain, spares inventory for that. So that's how we started this. Now we have a, several 3D printed spare parts. That's great. In the line. So that's one example of leaders thinking outside the box, willing to challenge, and then cooperate and communicate. Because once you put the barriers, there ends the growth. Well, and how do you get people to imagine, right? Because I think a lot of people think, well, what got them there is the way it's going to be in the future, or we've got best practices, or they're a little scared to learn all these analytics terms, right? It's kind of overwhelming. How do you get the leaders to imagine? Uh, great question, Laura. I think this all starts with the leadership. If the leadership statement is, it is OK to fail, but fail fast and integrate the learning into your next cycle. But keep your you know, like mind on value. It's OK to fail. That mentality makes people to go take risks. And in fact, we, have we recently started a supply chain innovation test lab for the whole purpose of testing different things. And we, many years ago, this probably would not have been possible. But now the question is the technology, the people, everything is changing. And if you're not ready, you're going to be left behind. And so how do you fund that test lab, Manny? Uh, you know, because a lot of people would like to do it, but they say, well, I can only do it if I've got a one or two year return on investment. And you know, we don't know what that return on investment is. Sometimes you don't know, but it all starts with the strategy, right? Okay, you know, like, tell me how the supply chain looks like. This is a question that comes from our CEO when he was a CEO. He said, how does the supply chain looks like 10 years from now, 20 years from now? 
we get into the roadmap activity. And then the capabilities we have this today. So do you think, for example, big data is gonna be a big deal for us in supply chain? The answer is yes. Okay, what are we doing about it? Oh, let's go implement Hadoop. Okay, crawl, walk, run. That's where the innovation, we fund that innovation for that. We also have uh, some decent amount of funding to go work with universities because that gives us an independent view of what they're working on, bringing in that, you know, like at a very modest investment and great, uh, you know, collaboration, the window to the world opens up. So we do those also. I remember a great story you told two years ago where you have co-ops with universities and you actually sometimes offer a job two or three years before they graduate, In fact, right? we hired a PhD student three years before he graduated. Every year he would come in as an intern, a great data scientist. It's hard to get the right people. So when you find them, I mean, our goal is bring the right people, interns, if they're really good, before their internship ends, they have a job offer. Even if it's two or three years out, right? Okay, what questions do you have for Manny? We have time for a couple questions here. We'll have some mics. Heather's got a mic, Karen's got a mic. Uh, any questions for Manny, asking the right questions, building the data-driven organization? Anyone got a question? Manny, you've been a great steward of analytics for the supply chain industry. I appreciate it. And Thanks, I just Laura. want to thank you. I, I love the fact that you're so active in organizations and support. So, Tim, you have a thank question? You. Hi, Manny. Um, thanks for your presentation. Um, we heard, uh, I think it was yesterday, that um, we need to get ahead around that the generations coming out of university now may only be with us for a couple of years before they're looking for the next opportunity. Um, what uh, firstly, do you, do you see those trends? And secondly, what do you do at Intel to make sure that you hold those talent longer? And in fact, do you try? Uh, what, I'm sorry, uh, trying to understand the question. What Intel does to? Uh, the, there's, the, the, it was, the seed was sown yesterday that um, the generation that's coming out of university now are only gonna stay with their current roles for a few years. We're not gonna see uh, industry professionals with 20 or 30 years experience. Uh, yeah. Great. Great. Mm -hmm. I, I think we are actually disrupting that before we get disrupted. We have rotations inside Intel, in supply chain, and uh, it used to be every seven years, we get a two month sabbatical break, paid, you know, like vacation, and the expectation is after seven years, you come back and do a different job. Now it is every four years. And you are not being forced out to go do something else, but you have the opportunity to go do something different. And then if you want to do something completely different, but it makes sense from your skill set as well as from the need perspective, even that is, that's a career discussion we have twice a year. And then we also, for newcomers, college graduates, we have a rotation program. They more, you know, like in a year, they spend three months in procurements, three months in planning. And at the end of the training, they decide, okay, this is where the right fit is. And the manager says, yeah, this makes sense. And the opportunity is we want to make sure that we don't want to lose a talented person to outside. We would make sure everything and anything we can do internally to nurture and keep them is what we do. Yeah, Chris Klaus was saying, you know, that now he's looking at three to four years, you know, really. You get four weeks. <laughs> <laughs> for uh, just job enrichment, that, you know, we're no longer looking for 25 to 30 year, 30 year jobs. So it was an interesting perspective. Any other questions before we move on? Okay, uh, Jane? Hi, Manny. So, you know, big organizations, we all kind of have the behavioral style interviewing process that we go through. So you really get one shot to decide is a person good or not, and you hope at best you made a 50-50, 50-50 probability you got good and some, some not so good. Do you, does Intel use that same type of behavioral style interviewing, or do you have any kinds of questions that you think are unique that help you find the right talent? So we have a combination of behavioral and technical, and uh, sometimes it's a set of questions, whether it is a team or leadership, or you know, like how do you, uh, in conflict management, how do you behave, or you know, those are all the things that we have. And every manager is offered that set. So don't just go ask optimization question, or we have a, a normally we have a, a team of people interviewing. And they, based on their, you know, sometimes they are more from a leadership, from a HR finance perspective. Some of them more technical. And 
some questions seem traditional, but we kind of, you know, like looking and understanding how the person answers on the fly, we try and ask questions. Because for us, if the person does not fit the culture or fit the culture, but able to come in and make the culture even better, we're open to that. So those are the kind of things we look for. So set of questions. Well, and I think it's important that companies know their culture, right? Everyone talks about we're going to have team players, but the teams are all different, right? As we talk about by the characteristics. Exactly. What is the team at Intel like? What are the characteristics? Uh, number one, customer focused. We have, in fact, a set of six values. Customer focused, result oriented, risk taking, disciplined in our approach to doing it, you know, great place to work. And another culture that, uh, you know, like is very common across Intel is, you know, it's okay, you, you and I are not gonna align on everything. So we sit and talk about several things, but you may not agree with me, but you will disagree, but commit to the path forward. So that is sometimes, that culture, I find it harder for some people to, you know, align with. Because when you hire type A personalities, mm -hmm. everyone have opinions. But when you put them together, that's where, you know, like when you're forming the team, we make sure that, hey, you know what? What kind of personality we have? What kind of skills? It's not just the skills, it's also the psychology plays in there. So we look at it. So disagree and commit is one of the things that really is a culture that we embrace, harder to embrace for new people. So you may disagree, but you're gonna commit to the path. Commit and make sure it works. So no maverick behavior. Okay, let's give Manny a big hand, thank you.